All right, so who are you? That's the question we're asking with a new series that we launched on uh, Resurrection Sunday last week. And, you know, when you ask the question, who are you? Some of you, probably not many of you, but uh, some of you may actually think, well, I am an INTJ. You know what I'm talking about. Like, you know, the, the, America has this fascination with these assess personality assessment profile things, you know, like one of them, the most popular one is the Myers Briggs. And, uh, you know, you take this test and they help you discern whether you're an introvert or extrovert, you know, are you intuitive? Are you sensing? Are you a thinker, feeler? Are you judge? Uh, kind of judgment or perception, like they kind of give you this thing and you end up after this test with a, you know, some letters, a series of letters. And so, you know, you, you go around and say, hi, I'm Danny, I'm I-N, I don't know what, I never can remember what my letters are. And I've taken this thing so many times and it seems to just adjust a little bit depending on, you know, the time of the day, how I'm feeling at any moment. Um, but, you know, Myers-Briggs, that, that's a popular one. I wonder how many of you have taken the, the Myers-Briggs. Give me a shake hand. Yeah. Oh, look at you. Look at you. You see, you have defined yourselves by this. You know, one of the ways we try to answer this thing, you know, like who are we, you know, is looking at our personality. Well, there's a number of these tests, right? There's the DIS test. We use that around here a lot. Are you a D? Are you an I? Are you an S or C? Well, I'm a high D. I've got some high I. I've got some D in there, you know, and you, you start kind of defining yourself a little bit that way. Um, you know, there's another one that's becoming more popular now, the Enneagram. Have you heard of that? You know, you get a number. You know, you, you, now you move away from the letters and you get a number. And what your number is going to reveal to you like what your main characteristics are. Like you can be a reformer. You can be a helper. You can be an achiever. You can be an individualist. You can be an investigator. You can be a loyalist, an enthusiast, a challenger, or a peacemaker. And each number is assigned to one of those. And so now you can have some letters and you can have some numbers and you're starting to build this whole sense of identity. And then there's a number of these assessment profiles that are just kind of fun. Like something that you can take like almost in five or ten minutes and it spits out like who you are. Uh, one that our staff has used for fun is this kingdomality assessment. And based on like how you answer these questions, you come out as either a bishop a benevolent ruler, a shepherd, a black knight, a merchant, a prime minister, a white knight, or a court jester. <laughs> Who do you think Chuck came out to be? <laughs> Wasn't really trying to tie his name so closely with court jester. I'll let you draw conclusion there. Okay, so there's all kinds of things. Well, why are we so, you know, obsessed with this? Some people have commented, you know, they've written, like, why are we obsessed with taking these, these assessments? And some say, well, that, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out who we are. Some say that, you know, that we like attention. Or some of us like looking for, like, okay, what are our strengths and weaknesses? And I kind of suspect that underlying it, you know, sometimes... You, you choose to do it because you're interested and other times maybe your employer is, is asking you to do it. But I think behind it sometimes is just a sense of like, what do I have to offer? Because sometimes I don't feel like I have anything to offer. But this test tells me that, hey, man, you really fit into an organization this way. And this is what you have to bring. Uh, sometimes we just aren't sure where we stand with people. Sometimes because we're so unrooted to a real sense of identity that explains who I am, that we just move to like how I relate or what I do, what can I contribute, when underlying all of it, I think, is a fascinating inquiry into like, who am I? Who's, what's my real identity? And so today, we're going to talk about that. What is our new identity? And I want to give you just a little bit of context. Last week, we said that if you place your faith in the resurrected Christ, you may recall we looked at some reasons why that's a reasonable step of faith to believe in the resurrected Christ, that if you do that, that 
several things happen. That all of a sudden you gain a new reality, you gain a new identity, what we're talking about today, a new destiny as well as new activity. And we're looking at all four of those things. Last week we talked about the new reality that all of a sudden our eyes are opened when we embrace the resurrected Christ. It's like a new paradigm, a new worldview. We kind of summarized it with that classic uh, quote from C.S. Lewis. And I want to read that to you again. He says, I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. And that's what we saw last week, that when you embrace the resurrected Christ, there's a number of implications that follow from that. One was a whole new reality. But now that brings us to today, that with that faith in the resurrected Christ, that I find that I have inherited a completely new identity. And this is really important to us because at times we define ourselves by what others think about us or what we want others to think about us. We find ourselves often playing games, like trying to pretend to be something so that you will like me, so that you will affirm me. Could it be possible that you might even love me? Now, I've got to hide these things from you because certainly if you knew this stuff about me, you wouldn't want to be around me. Or if I can promote myself in a way where you're impressed with me, where you, you know, you validate me, that somehow you, in your opinion, justify my existence. And so I end up kind of relating, I kind of get, really messed up in the way I relate to others because I'm unsure of who really I am. I'm insecure in that. And so when Jesus says, who was raised from the dead, and says that you who put your faith in me, like several things happen, not just a new reality, but a new identity. And so in order to uncover that, what I want to do is look at several passages today. We're going to do a little bit of work. I'm going to introduce you to some words that most of you have heard, but some of you have not. These are kind of the $5 theological words that talk about a specific part of the work that Christ did for us, okay? There's a specific uh, part. You can break down the work of Christ on the cross and the resurrection, and you can break that down because each one has real implications about our identity. All right, so w w that's enough intro. Let let's just jump in here. The first word that I want us to consider is the word propitiation. Propitiation. Now, you can go home today and really impress some people. You just drop that in some casual conversation. You know, you're at work and you just say, you know, I was considering my propitiation this weekend. Now, that's a word that you really want uh, to uh, become familiar with. Get your arms around it. Because as you can see here, it basically speaks to the idea of the satisfaction of God's wrath by Christ's work. The satisfaction of God's wrath by Christ's work. For instance, if you've been around the Bible, you know that we're told that, you know, you come into this world, we're children of wrath. Romans 1.18 says the wrath of God is manifest toward all those who basically have rejected him, have rejected truth. And um, we kind of come into the world with this sentence of being under the wrath of God because we have committed high treason against our creator who basically says, I want you to experience life as I've designed it. And he put mankind in this perfect environment and everything was great. And the one prohibition that he gave them, they uh, sinned against that, basically said that I believe that I can discover life apart from you, God, that I know better about life. And so we've all gone our own way. And as a result of that, our relationship with God became severed and we came under the judgment of God, the curse that fell at the fall of mankind. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. And that was the sad state that we were in. Now some of us were openly rebellious toward God. And some of us were just... I think even worse, just indifferent. 
Like, I don't care about you, God. <laughs> and because of that, we were under this state, this sentence of the wrath of God. But I want you to look at 1 John chapter 4. This is the first passage we're going to look at. 1 John chapter 4. Number of passages we can mention, uh, Romans 3, earlier in 1 John, uh, Hebrews uh, 2, that talk about the propitiation. But in each case, they're looking at it slightly differently, but it speaks to the ability of Jesus Christ that when he uh, died on the cross, that he absorbed the wrath of God in our place. Um, and so by his death, he satisfied the wrath of God. But I want you to see uh, John's perspective on this in 1 John chapter 4. Let me start reading verse 9. It says, In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And so what we learn here is that while we were under the sentence of the wrath of God, which we justly deserve, the just wrath of God, that surprisingly, God went after us in his love for us. That there was somehow this huge cosmic dilemma where God said, in my holiness, and my justice, I demand payment for the sins of mankind. But that God in his love decided that the only way to solve that sin problem was for God himself to absorb the punishment. And so God the Son, Jesus Christ, went to the cross to die. And we see here the surprising love of God that pursued us. John Eldridge calls it a sacred romance. It's the idea that God who could have let us lie in the bed we made, basically said, I'm coming after you. And that God uh, becomes this loving pursuer. And that even though once married to him, that we had all committed spiritual adultery, we le learn over and over again in the prophets, how we abandoned God, that he nevertheless says, I'm gonna pursue you. And so, you know, we see that God sought us out with the surprising love of God. And it was the sacrifice of God that satisfied the wrath of God. Now, that may not be new to you, but I think we typically think that when Christ died on the cross, that, you know, he was paying for our sins, and that sometimes we fail to appreciate the significance of what's happening here. That when Jesus died that he was actually absorbing, he was taking the hit for you and for me. And that all of the fury of the just wrath of God was poured out on him. Now, it's one thing to endure the kind of pain that was involved in the crucifixion. But perhaps even more painful was just the emotional separation from God that occurs. And so when Jesus yells out, quoting from the Psalms, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That at that moment, that there is a separation that takes place there. And that God the Son, who for all eternity past, has enjoyed this unity and intimacy with God the Father and God the Spirit, suffers this temporary separation. And it's incredible. And though it should have been you and should have been me, it was him. Now, what's the implication of that? Well, first of all, the identity is this, is that when I am dearly loved by God. Oh, you might say I am beloved. Oh, we use the word beloved different from love because uh, to be beloved is to be greatly loved, the dictionary defines, is to be especially dear to the heart of someone. And so when you think about yourself, you think, man, I am Dearly loved by God. I am the beloved. And so for many people, like this is incredible news. Because some often feel very unloved. Uh, they feel many times rejected. And if you've ever suffered any kind of abandonment. If you've ever felt like nobody really wants me. No one values me. No one wants me. That whenever you feel that way 
that all you have to do is remember how much God loves you, how much God values you, how much God has pursued you, how much God wants you. That's the reality. That's the sacred romance. And so uh, many, many people wrestle with those feelings and, and now they replace those with the fact that, man, I've been pursued by God. I'm dearly loved by God. I am beloved. Many people feel like, you know, I have my failure, my particular moral failure in my life has just so tainted me that I wear this scarlet letter around my neck and that God nor anyone else could ever really love me. And so with people, I do my best to hide that, you know, and shield that. But I'm always fearful that someone's going to find out. But what's beautiful about God is that he knows you completely and yet loves you so intimately. Like anything that, you know, is in the closet, some kind of skeleton in the closet, some kind of, you know, sin, some kind of, like God knows you completely. You see, we love this passage because we're reminded, hey, man, we're not connecting with God because we chose him. It's not because we started pursuing him. Like Jesus went in your place, in my place to the cross before we ever loved him. You know, it says that clearly. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Like that has huge implications. And so one way that we need to think about ourselves is this, is that, man, I'm, I'm beloved. I am loved by God. There's a second word I want to remind you about, and this is more common. This is the word justification. The word uh, justification is a legal term. It means to be declared righteous. It means to be acquitted. It means to be uh, not, uh, found not guilty. Uh, so uh, to be declared righteous. The passage I want us to look at is Romans. So you have to turn uh, to the, uh, toward the beginning of the New Testament, come to the book of Romans. And I want you to look at chapter 3, verses 20 through 25. And I want us to think about uh, this idea of justification. Um, verse 20 says, No unbelief uh, made him waver. I'm in chapter 4. I want chapter 3. Okay, I think that sounded funny. Okay, watch this. It says, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. All right, so the, remember, the law was unfit to actually give us righteousness. The, what the law was really good at was to expose unrighteousness, like a speed limit sign. Remember that? Speed limit sign is only good to show you that you're breaking the law. It doesn't really help you stay you know, it doesn't help you obey the law. It just kind of shows you when you're not obeying. That's what the law did. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. There we see that word again. So here, justification, this idea of being declared righteous, first of all, is not by grit. Uh, what we mean by that is not by just trying to, you know, uh, obey the, outs the external demands of the law. It's not by self-effort. I can't work my way, which is the biggest fallacy when it comes to being right with God that we think we have to work our way into his favor. But here we find that it's not by grit, but it's by grace. He says, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe for there's no distinction, we've all sinned, fall short of the glory of God, and that we are justified by what? By grace. 
It's not by grit, but by grace as a gift. Justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So we have been declared righteous. The second part of our new identity in Christ, all of us who have placed our faith in the resurrected Christ, is that I am righteous. I have been declared righteous by God. Now the problem is, is that most of us are aware of, you know, times that we sin, you know, each day, each hour, seemingly. Like that we wrestle that with the fact that we know that sin is still part of our life. But God says that I declare that you are righteous in my sight. And so you have to reconcile that. And the way that you do is that you really focus on your identity. That you have been declared righteous. That you've been set apart. That you've been made holy. You've been sanctified. In fact, I want to read you a passage. I didn't put this in the slides. Let me just read this to you. I'm going to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I want you to see the, the, the relationship between activity and identity. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul's writing and he says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now watch this. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. That's not who you are anymore. That is not your identity. In fact, the way that you overcome some of these sins in your day-to-day -day activity is by focusing on your new identity. We have this position before God where he sees us as righteous people in Christ. We've been declared not guilty. We've been declared righteous. And by focusing on that identity, it's easier for my activity to begin lining up. My position is as a righteous man. My practice is to release and live out that righteousness. Position, practice. That's the, that's the idea here. We've been declared righteous. You know, um, some of us view ourselves as M&Ms. You know, we, we really work hard at kind of, you know, cleaning up the outside and getting all shiny and beautiful, you know. But we really view ourselves inside as just darkness. That there's nothing good. Just darkness. And the outside, we're all shiny. But inside, we're just darkness. It's better to view yourself as sterling silver. A sterling silver saints, I would say. See, we're not just sinners trying to act like saints. We are genuine saints who sometimes still sin. We're like this genuine sterling silver, though at times tarnished with sin. But fundamentally, we're not just sinful that in Christ, we are righteous. And that we live our life day by day by allowing God to live love and lead through us, to live a righteous life through us, that each day our activity, our practice would conform more and more to our position and our identity as righteous people. That's the idea. Uh, so you're not an m, &M. I hope that's good news to you. So I am beloved, I am righteous. Third uh, word that I want to introduce you to is the word imputation. Imputation. Uh, to impute was to either to charge something to someone's account or to credit something to one's account. Uh, when we talk about the imputation in terms of the work of Christ, it's the idea that the righteousness of Christ has been credited to our account. Now watch this, the sin of mankind, my sin, was charged to Jesus' account. But the righteousness of Christ was credited to my account. 
You see, I, I sometimes wrestle with this. I say, okay, wow, propitiation. Christ died. He satisfied the wrath of God for me. So now, man, I'm off death row. Like, he's paid the penalty for me. But then God says, now I declare you to be righteous. And I think, how can I be declared righteous? I mean, I understand that, like, the, I'm no longer, uh, you know, headed for the penalty of my sin. I've been saved from the penalty of my sin, but you're going to declare me righteous? How does that make sense, God? Well, the, one of the ways that it makes sense is because of this word imputation. Uh, let's look at it together. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians. I told you we're going to do some work today. Look at several passages. Chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and there's a couple of verses that appear in this passage that I want to call to your attention. And the first one is verse 21. Chapter 5, verse 21, it says this. It says, for our sake, he made him. Now, the first he is God. Him would be Jesus. For our sake, God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, that's often called the great exchange. It's the idea that when Christ died, he took our sins from us. And that particular work gets all the press. Christ died for our sins. Christ died for our sins. And we uh, lean hard and heavy, and rightly so, on the fact that Christ took his, our sins upon himself. But what this verse reminds us is that it didn't stop there. That not only were our sins charged to Christ's account, but his righteousness, that we might become the righteousness of God, was credited to our account. They were imputed to you and to me, all of those who have placed our faith in the resurrected Christ. And that's incredible news. What that means for us is that I am new. Like, I'm, I'm completely new. In other words, I have not just been declared righteous, I have been made righteous. Like the same way that I'm forgiven is the same way that I am now righteous in God's eyes. Okay, earlier um, in the same chapter there, verse 17, we're told this. Chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. So all those who have embraced Christ, like, man, like, we're... This new creation. That's what I mean that we are new. Like something that is old is passed away. And something that is new has come. Now we don't have the time, but Romans chapter 6 explains to us that who we once were, our old man. That who we used to be before Jesus, that person has died. That he was crucified with Christ, associated, identified with Jesus in his death. And that now who we are is a new man raised with Jesus to live a new life. Now, the reality is we still have a sin nature. That we still struggle with sin, this side of heaven. But we're no longer who we used to be. Someone trapped and captured and under the power, a prisoner of sin. That that person died and there's a new person alive. And that person is a new creation. And what is now true of us is that we have the righteousness of Christ. And so when you wrestle with your sin, when you wrestle with your, your struggle and your, uh, perhaps your addictions, that what you have to do is stay focused on, like, I'm not defined by these things. Like, who I really am is someone who is righteous before God. That he sees me that way. You see, when you became a Christian, when you placed your faith in the resurrected Christ, that God opened up a file drawer labeled sin and condemnation. And he found your file and he picked it up and he opened up a new drawer that says, in Christ, righteous. And that he found the file for Jesus and he dropped your file into his file. And so that now in Christ, I enjoy this righteous standing before God and I enjoy this righteous reality about who I am that I'm trying to live out day to day by the power of the Spirit. I am new. That's why, my friends, you can no longer say, hey, look, this is just who I am 
and I'm never going to change. As some kind of excuse for acting out in a sinful way. Look, this is just who I am. Get used to it. That the person who has embraced Jesus, who has been given a new identity, learns to think this way. Man, I, I apologize for this. That's not really who I am. And I know Jesus is at work helping me to live from the inside out this righteousness that he has planted in me. That I have this new disposition and I lived, I acted inconsistently with my identity. When you confess your sin before God, God, I acknowledge that I was impatient and I was harsh. And I know that that is not who I really am. I acted outside of my identity. And God, I confess that. Thank you for your forgiveness. That all of that follows from the fact that I am new. The last word that we want to look at is a word that you're more familiar with. And this is simply the word adoption. It just means that we have been placed in God's family. That we've been placed in God's family. You can look backwards again to Romans chapter 8. And I'll show you these familiar verses. Uh, chapter 8, starting with verse 14. It says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father, uh, Daddy, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. We learn here that we have been placed by the Spirit into God's family. And that we perceive by the Spirit that we are children of God. That I'm a son of God, that I'm a daughter of God, I'm a child of God. That we are now included. Uh, that would be an implication here. Is that now I am included. Whereas many people, you know, try to fit in with others. And that when you experience rejection, uh, that that brings pain. That there's this sense that, like, what do I need to do to fit in with these new work colleagues or these students? I remember when I w went into the ninth grade, into high school, and there were several middle schools that kind of fed in uh, to this high school, and you were trying to figure out, like, where am I going to fit? I remember walking down the hall, and seeing kind of the you know, where the jocks hung out and they're all kind of talking and, and then, you know, walk a little bit further and, and there were, uh, you know, what we called the rednecks and, you know, they were all dressed a certain way and they were listening to that thing called country music and, and, and you walk a little bit further and you had kind of the people who were really most known by the, their academic excellence and, you know, National Honor Society and like you had all these different cliques and groups and you remember that well. And you remember walking and you think, man, which of these groups can I fit in with? And I remember going, man, I don't know if I fit in with either of these things. And you walk into the cafeteria and everybody's sitting and you're thinking like, Where, who am I sitting with? That many people go forward in life feeling that way all the time. Like, I just don't know where I fit in or do I belong? And what God says is that because of what Jesus has done for us, we belong to the most important family that has ever existed and what God has done. Uh, that he has included us and made us part of his family. I am included. I want you to listen to this quote. Uh, this is by Thomas Kelly. And he says this, he says, the experience of God breaking into a human life is the experience of an invasion from beyond of an other who in gentle power breaks in upon our littleness and in tender expansiveness makes room for himself. Suddenly, a tender giant walks by our side. No, he strides within our puny footsteps. We are no longer our little selves. That we have a completely new identity because Jesus, his spirit has invaded our lives. Who are you? You are... A B-R-N-I. You're beloved. Uh, you are righteous. You're new. You're included. 